Willie D Live. It's Willie D, y'all, back with another episode of information and instructions to help you navigate through this wild, crazy, beautiful world in the studio, Van Lathan. What's up, G? What's up, King? I'm good, my man. Oh, man. I see you got the Texas hat. You know? oh, I'm doing my we thing. We ain't necessarily Texas, but, you know, the yeah, Cowboy hats no. worldwide. Well, Cowboy hats worldwide. I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So Baton Rouge, yeah. I show a little, show a little deference and... Uh, respect to my lineage there as the black cowboys from Maryland, Louisiana, where my daddy from. Right. Yeah. Baton Rouge, man. How did you get from Baton Rouge to TMZ? On purpose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was working in Baton Rouge on different projects that would come through Louisiana mm -hmm. um, because Louisiana has a tax credit. So a lot of stuff is shot in Louisiana. A lot of big movies shot in Louisiana. Sometimes you don't, you you can't tell. You know, you describe them, or they disguise them a little bit. And there was a movie that came through in 2005 called The Reaping. It was with Idris Elba, big Hollywood movie. They took the 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 Walmart on Plank Road, and they made it into a a, a soundstage. And I was the stage manager of the Walmart on Plank Road as the soundstage. That was the same year that Hurricane Katrina came through. So I was able to save up some money. The production went long because we were down. I was able to save up some money, and then I moved out to L.A. After the hurricane came through, um, to me, that was like a sign that anything that I wanted, I had to go get it real quick and not wait on things. And so Katrina? I came out to L.A. Hurricane Katrina? Hurricane Katrina, 2005. Yeah. yeah. Man, Baton Rouge is one of those type of cities. Baton Rouge remind me of, like, the relationship that New Jersey have with New York, mm. Baton Rouge relationship with New Orleans. Mm. It's like, yeah, y'all talking about New Orleans, man. You know, like, we got our own thing out here, too. We doing our own thing. Y'all real serious. People that's from Baton Rouge, man, y'all right, y'all pride on y'all chest, man, yeah. for real. Yeah, New Orleans is the heart of the state, but Baton Rouge is the brain. Mm. So Baton Rouge is the place where the political decisions for the rest of the state are made. It's a place where you get right to it. Like, no, we have all of the culture of South Louisiana, but we don't have any tourists um, besides people that are coming for Southern games or LSU game. So whatever we doing, we got to do it because we want to do it. We're not putting a smile on our face to make somebody come to our town and stay there for an extra couple of days. We're not trying to sell you our culture. By the way, this is not a diss to New Orleans. New Orleans is one of the most unique, amazing places in the entire world. But I'm just saying for us, everything that's happening there, we we don't got no commercial. There's no commercial saying come to Baton Rouge. If you're there, you're there for a purpose. So whatever happens, we get right to it. Yeah. Do you know Isaiah Carey? Yeah. Yeah. Went to the, we went to the same high school. He was there before me, but we went to the same high school. That's a McKinley guy. Right. Yeah. Right, right. Shouts out to Isaiah, man. Oh, right now, let me tell you something. This, to me, right now, is the golden age of Baton Rouge alumni. When you look at people from all over the place, when you look at Gates, Young Boy, you know, and hip-hop, of course, Boosie and Webby, the guys that got it started, Fox, all of those dudes, Box, Royale, all of those guys from back in the day, Max Minnelli, all of I wish I could name them all right here. Um, and then when you look at it in media, you got myself, you got Isaiah, you know what I mean? When you just, Ted James, somebody who was uh, went to high school with me, it's a great person to have on the podcast, who's now running for mayor of Baton Rouge. You got Marcus Spears and Ryan Clark. Now, Ryan Clark is not from Baton Rouge, but he lives in and around there now. Marcus Spears is a homeboy that's from right there. Right, the guy yeah. you see these guys on ESPN, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know Michael Clayton doing this thing at, at Tampa Bay. You see all of that stuff. So this is the golden age of people from our city being able to like uh, speak in media and different places like that, and have our influence out there. How'd you get that job on that soundstage? Um, so there was a show that came to Louisiana, that came to Southern University where I was going to college at the time. At the time, it's called College Hill. It's on BET. Right. First black. And I got a PA job on that. So my man Tommy Talley hooked me up with a PA job on that. And that was my first job in TV. So once you get your foot in, then you have the one thing, and this is the, the most fucked up thing about this industry or any industry, is experience is the one thing that they want more than anything. And it's the thing that's the hardest to get. And so right. I had to end because my friend was already working on the show. I had the experience of, you know, 
giving input and working on a production and then it was easy for me to get the next production and the next production because I was in and once I got the job on that movie I'm like this is my last one doing it here and I moved out to LA yeah that's interesting that you said that about a experience because my goddaughter who is Sierra Rogers you know who that is yeah so so friend of mine is that right yeah okay so Sierra well you probably know the story Sierra yeah. when she first went to LA she was going around looking for marketing jobs and mm -hmm. stuff, and she couldn't get any work. Nobody would hire her. She went on job interview after interview after interview after interview after interview, after interview and she couldn't get hired. Mm -hmm. So finally, she just started selling the clothes literally off her back. Right. And that's how she built her empire. Mm -hmm. But they wanted her to have experience. She was very qualified. She's always had a knack for, for style, always had that knack. Mm -hmm. But they would not hire her. But, you know... They're lost because look yeah. at her now. If she had went and, t and, and taken that job for them, she might be on that on that little wheel, you know, uh, that a lot of people find themselves on and, and you know, with the golden cuffs. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, when you look at her and her sister, they have, um, Chris, they have an entrepreneurial spirit. They, so Tell when, me about it. When somebody's <laughs> like that. Yeah. It's just a matter of time. It's, be it's better for people like that to actually, and it doesn't seem like this, but it's better for people like that to actually have doors shut on them because mm -hmm. their innate they're, sense they're, is to go get it. resilient. Yeah. yeah. And so people like that get to working in a job five, ten years before they go, this is not for me. So mm -hmm. it's almost better for them to do it themselves because at the end of the day, they're not going to be comfortable doing it for somebody else. Right, right. Yeah, shout out to Sierra and Chrissy, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about real life, female, feminine hustlers. You dig what I'm saying? Is that, yeah. Is that, can we phrase that? Can we coin that phrase? Feminine, feminine hustlers, hustlers yeah. 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 Um, man, talk about your journey from, talk about your journey from TMZ to starting your own platform, which is highly successful. Congratulations. On Appreciate it. you. Well, yeah. the, TMZ was a tremendous, it was of a tremendous importance as far as me learning how to be a figure in the media, uh, learning how to source a story, learning how to understand even bias in media, understanding that the person that is at the top of a place shapes that place to their sensibility. It's like coaching a college football team. The team takes on the personality of the coach. So if the coach is undisciplined, not doing the right thing, the team going to get a whole bunch of penalties. They're going to go out there, helter-skelter or whatever. But if you're playing for Nick Saban, a guy who has structure and process, then you're going to see a structure and process team. People think that the media or uh, media operations or entities are different than that. They're not. Whoever's at the top of these places, whoever runs these places, they then have their personality. Everyone in that little place becomes a little different version of them. Um, and so the sensitivities and the biases and the worldview of those entities become a reflection of the brass at the top of them. Uh, and so when I learned that, it made me a lot less precious about what, we, what I see in the media. Right. Mm. Um, because you have people in media positions that aren't culturally literate. So they don't know. And you might think that they know and they're fucking with you, but they really don't know. Whitney Houston dies. I remember at TMZ and we, we're covering the story. And one of the guys in the um, in the office goes, man, have you ever heard of a home going? And I was like, what you what, what do you mean? He's like, she's having a special kind of funeral. It, she's not having a regular funeral. She's having something called a home going, which I'm hearing is a big deal in the black community. Have you heard of a home going before? I'm like, whoa, you fucking with me? She's going home. She's going home to Jesus. She's going home to God. Like home going, sunrise, sunset. It's like it's a, this is a funeral in the black church way of having a funeral. But the term home going is simply a term used because you're going home to Jesus. You're going home to glory. Whatever. Sending her back to where she came from. Exactly. She's going home. Yeah. It's not a thing. It's not something that needs an intellectual dissertation. And when the story was written and it was like, people felt the way. People were like, why they, but they don't know. So is it fair to say that 
TMZ contributes to the toxicity in our culture? Sure. Yeah. But they... What or, I, or is it that just what people no, 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 no. see? Yeah, they definitely do. But what I would say is not especially, right? So, without a doubt. But they not... At least when I was there, there wasn't an edict to be like, let's fuck over these people. It was kind of an understanding that we don't care if we fuck over these people because we don't really care if we fuck over anyone except for the culture that's represented by the people at the top of TMZ. Right. So sometimes it's not about who you're trying to destroy, because what we think some what we think sometimes is that if somebody's sitting behind a table and they're making a bunch of decisions and those decisions are like, let's fuck over black people, let's fuck over gay people, let's fuck over women, let's fuck over the people. What if that's not it? What if you just don't care about how they feel? Not that you're trying to fuck them over, but you just don't care about how they feel. Or you're indifferent. You're indifferent, right? Those people, though, because of situations that exist in society, they might need you to care about how they feel because dangerous narratives that target them might have been A, more successful in the past, and then B, also more dangerous in the past. So how do we have the conversation about vulnerable and at-risk portions of the American population with groups that go, hey, we give it to everybody the same. Well, it's not this, it doesn't feel the same when you're talking about certain groups because certain groups, the narratives about them are used to then kill them, right? So anytime you're in any place where black people and black culture are not represented at the very tops of that place, you should be having conversations about uh, how black people are portrayed. I remember I had a conversation with a brother from the nation and there was something that had happened with the nation and I wanted to cover it on TMZ. I wanted to, to, to cover it on there. And I was talking with him and he said to me, he said, I was like, okay, we'll put this on and we'll cover this. And it was a story about them or for them or whatever that it was involving them. And he goes, well, we'll just let you know something. You don't have control of how this gets put out there. We know that. However, just to let you know, if this goes up and it goes sideways, we will blame you. I never forgot about that. Because we will have to blame you. It will be your responsibility to shepherd this and have this respond uh, uh, reflected in a way that's truthful and powerful and not derogatory to us. And I was like, I can't guarantee how the story is going to go because I don't have final editorial voice on anything there. So it's better that you know, we don't do it. And he respected that. So the responsibility of, if you care, of a person culturally when you're at any entity uh, is to make sure that to the degree that you can be an influence um, on the people that are writing stories or portraying your culture to make sure that they're not taking unfair shots or uh, being pernicious in the way that they that they reflect and, and, and show your people. It's hard. You'll lose jobs doing that. So how does your background in the media uh, and your perspective that you have with the media translate into your own plat platform that you have now? Uh, now I, well, two things. Number one, I have to be 100% true to myself, whether or not the audience agrees or doesn't agree, right? 100% true to myself because I realize that people have been conditioned in both ways. Like right now, people are conditioned to not have conversations that are difficult to have. They don't want it. Anytime it's like, oh my God, you're putting us at risk, you're doing all of this, sometimes you just gotta talk to the devil. You just have to sometimes, right? You have to. But more than anything with me, you just can't fucking care. You, 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 you can't care about your perspective. You, you have to give your perspective based upon your research, your life experience, and what it is that you've, uh, that you've encountered. And so for me, I've had a very unique path to get to where I am. So the things that I believe, I don't believe them willy-nilly. I don't believe something because I saw a meme. I don't believe something because I heard it. I read a book and I lived it. And that's why I believe it. So if you can't deal with that, you can't deal with me. Who taught you that in Baton Rouge? My dad. Your dad? Yeah. Give me a typical conversation you and your dad would have. 
Um, he had a very roundabout way of telling me what his truth was. Not a roundabout way. That's not right. He had a very direct way of telling me what his truth was. And it never really took into consideration my feelings. He was message oriented. So it, it must have been, I would just consider the age here. It must have been the fourth grade. And there was this girl. This is the fourth grade. And there was this girl. And she liked me. And I liked her. And we were doing our little boyfriend, girlfriend thing, which is whatever you could do when you fucking when you're 10 years old. Nine, 10 years old. And I remember, I remember the first feeling of jealousy that I ever really had. New guy comes into the thing, and he was from somewhere else, you know, and he had, like, super nice clothes. So we would come in, super nice clothes. Oh, we some little South Baton Rouge ragamuffins. But he was from some different place. He had nice clothes, the whole thing, whatever. And I knew it. You know, when you see the light-skinned nigga, you know it's going to be a problem, right? <laughs> like... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Especially when you see the light skin nigga, you know it's going to be a problem, right? <laughs> and so I'd already built it up in my mind. And then after a while, I mean, one time I saw them sharing chips. I'm like, damn, man. First of all, this nigga got chips. I don't have no chips. Where you get the chips from? Like, we didn't have chip type money. Like, what's going on with this guy? This guy got the clothes and he got the chips. He's sliding the lays the whole night. He might as well have been making it rain lays on. So he robbed me. He took it. After a little while, I remember, so I was out there playing basketball and they was, her and her little friend was trying to talk to me. And I'm like, no, nah, we playing basketball. And then the girl just showed out. She don't want to be with you no more. She don't want to go with you no more. I was like, God damn, in front of all these people like that. <laughs> so I get home and I'm telling my dad about this. My dad is talking to me. I'm a kid. And my dad goes, son, let me tell you something. He was like, I want you to remember this when you're dealing with women for the rest of your life. And he was like, it's not your pussy, it's your turn. He told you that that long ago? Yep. You've been up on game. He's like, it's not your pussy, it's your turn. I was like, what you mean? He was like, I don't want you to say nothing to, to these little girls like that. Don't talk like that. But he was like, a woman is in your life for as long as she chooses to be in your life. And that's a little deal that you make. He's like, your mama loved me and I love your mama. But every single day that your mama chooses to be with me, your mama chooses to be with me. And if she left, it would hurt bad. It would hurt a lot. All of that. But... You got to move on. Like, you don't control these women's minds, and you don't control their bodies. So find you the next little girl, get over it, and, and get yourself right. You say he dressed nice. Why you look like that? Dress better. We'll get you nice clothes. Care about yourself. Take care of yourself. Do all of that stuff. This is what women are going to be into. He didn't allow me to feel like a victim of something that happened. He, his thing always was, son, things in life happen to you, but the way that you react to them and the way that you prepare yourself will always dictate your wins and losses. Mm. So no matter what it was, and sometimes, you know, there are times when I saw my dad be violent. He carried a big uh, 357 Magnum wherever he went, and he would always be like, it's not just for show. If it was just for show, I wouldn't put no bullets in it. So... I'm not like he was, cause he was, he liked, he liked to, to, I mean, he liked to show you that gun. I'm a little bit different, but for for me, I just had somebody that I knew cared about me, and that who wouldn't lie to me when it came to my development. Why is it so hard to import that on men? In general, and I would say today, but it's been happening well before today. So many dudes, man, when a woman don't want to be with them anymore or a woman rejects them, uh, she don't want to do what they want uh, them to do, if they want, what they want her to do. They snap. They, a lot of times, especially today, it's kill, kill, kill. First thing come to their mind is kill. And, I mean, you hit the home run when you said, man, they can be here today, gone tomorrow. Like we don't, we don't own each other. Yeah. You know, what's what's up with that? I I can't figure it out because I'm not going to put myself in a position where 
I'm going to get hurt. Allow a woman to hurt me and then hurt myself. You dig what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a human being, obviously. So if a woman don't want me anymore that I'm with, she don't want to be with me anymore, obviously it's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. But I already know, I got enough sense to know that time heals all wounds. I'm going to get past this. I just got to keep on waking up, and, you know, going to bed and waking up. Yeah. And it's going to be in my rearview mirror. So I operate like if I get in a jam, I'm not going to put myself in a further jam. I'm not going to be sitting in jail and somebody asks me, what you in here for? Oh, man, I had to kill this hoe. I'm not killing no hoe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you dig what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah. sitting in jail. To me, for, for me, that would be insult to injury that, yeah. oh, so you in jail over a hoe. Mm -hmm. You dig what I'm saying? Yeah. Why is it so hard to impart that on dudes and why is it so hard for them to get it? Well, Number the first thing we have to discuss is whether or not people are emotionally re emotional emotionally regulated anyway whether or not they're emotionally regulated right because there's a lot of things you shouldn't kill for there's a lot of things that you, that shouldn't bring you to violence shouldn't drive you to violence there's a lot of things that you shouldn't wrap your manhood up in um and women or your relationships with women is just one of them right uh a, a lot of times I think men are socialized number one, to believe that they have dominion over women, that they own women, and they react to women, the they react to women asserting their freedom in the same way that a slave master reacts to a slave. I was just thinking that as soon as you were saying, go ahead. Uh, asserting their freedom. Mm -hmm. So if... A slave says, hey, I want to I wanna be free. Fuck you, massa. Well, you got to kill the slave. Not only do you have to kill the slave for myriad reasons, or at least discipline the slave, right? Number one, you don't want the other slaves getting that idea. Everybody would think that they're free. And number two, your entire worldview is, is, uh, has been informed to say that this is a thing that I own. So... Before you even do something for the structure of maintaining a proper plantation, there's an emotional re response to where you go, what? Lower thing? L like, lower thing? You don't talk to me like that. Let me show you what I do. Let me make you smaller or deader than you were before. And th this comes with just emotionally regulating ourselves and how much that we put into ourselves. That's why, I like, whatever podcast I go on, Jason Wilson I always mention his name from Michigan, the Cave of Adullam. Just, this is not a man that, he's not a guy that men can't look up to. He's a man that is a fighter. He's a man that is proficient with a weapon. He's a guy that has a background in the streets of Detroit. But what he is now is he's made a brand and a mission out of being a father and a husband and a mentor. And he emotionally regulates young men. And it's allowing them to feel vulnerable, allowing them to feel, hey, this might hurt, but you got to get through it without hurting somebody else. So first thing we got to do before we talk about, you know, why we would react certain ways with certain women is we have to talk about whether or not men are emotionally regulated and what it means to uh, pop off in, in violence because something isn't going your way or because you feel a certain disrespect or because you feel uh, a certain disappointment. Like, why are we lashing out? Are we really talking about our mental health and our feelings and how we are? Because, and we're always going to be, there are always going to be people who have like a screw loose or they're chemically imbalanced or whatever. I watch an interrogation video. I watch interrogation videos online all the time. Cause I wonder when are these people going to ask for a lawyer and the kid that had beat this guy to death in Michigan, white boy it was just clear that he was fucked up in the head right it's just clear he was fucked up in the head and beyond that what i'm talking about is whether or not we're doing enough to raise comprehensive men in our society and do we even care about having them anymore hmm. if there's two things in life that a man has to control he has to learn how to control to if he is to get close to reaching his apex and that is his emotions and his penis. Mm. Got to be able to control that. In fact, 
I wasn't always at the best at doing that. Mm -hmm. Got myself in a lot of jabs. But once I figured it out, ooh we man, mm -hmm. off the chain. That's why it's important for boys to have male role models uh, and have their fathers in their lives because a father can tell a son, look, man, like your daddy told you, that was invaluable, what, that information he gave you. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get that information, who knows, you could have ended up being like some of these other guys out here who, excuse my French and pardon my vernacular, but can't let a hoe be a hoe. You know? <laughs> it's, it's very difficult for them to do that. Uh, you had a, a very uh, public confrontation with Kanye West at T TMZ. Yeah. What was your role at TMZ at that time? I was a senior producer for TMZ Sports and a TMZ television personality. I was on all three shows. Right. So when you gave your take, I had never heard you really speak at length on anything before. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I never re re had really just heard you. I saw you, you give a quick take, quick take. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But never saw. When I saw that, I was like, oh, shit. This dude is about to blow up. Mm -hmm. I, I was like, I was like, and I know that's what, not what you were thinking, yeah. but it was almost like you couldn't wait to be able to speak your mind like with complete autonomy. Yeah. Like you couldn't wait to do that shit. Like when you let off on that, you was hitting all cylinders. You know, uh, every you didn't you didn't miss words and you didn't waste words. Mm -hmm. Did you think about? The consequences of airing somebody that big out at your job in front of the whole world, did you think about it before you did it? Or nah. you just The one thing that I will say about TMZ is that your perspective is your perspective. Okay. They're not going... There's, there's very few things you can say on TMZ to get yourself in trouble. He, They would rather you have, at least when I was there, they would rather you have like an uncut, unvarnished opinion on something. You have complete freedom to cover things, to do things, and to say things. So I wasn't worried about any blowback. I was, certainly wasn't worried about any blowback from him because, I mean, what is he? What is he going to do to me? Um, it, it, it just it. I was embarrassed for him, and I was embarrassed for myself because I had been a consistent defender of him for a long time on the show. Yeah, and for context, this is the. Slavery well, was is a choice. Slavery yeah, was yeah, a choice yeah. statement that Kanye made. Right. And so uh, I was like, hey, you know, um, for me, I was wondering, I really wanted to talk to him about where he was at this stage of his life and why we were now uh, getting the brunt of all of Kanye's ire, why it was coming back at us when we had given him this gigantic platform to go out and speak and talk and say things like, what he what was what was up with him, and then um it was always gonna come out not being disrespectful. It was always gonna come out in in love and in concern because I don't have any disdain for him. I, I like I don't I wasn't mad at Kanye West. I loved Kanye West, you know. And uh, so my thing is like, why us? Why are you why are you dissing the ancestors? Why are you talking like this in front of them? Why are you dissing the ancestors? Why are you dissing the ancestors in front of them? Why are you making us sound weak? Like, why are you talking like this in front of them? I'm in, I'm in this building every single day trying my best. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not crying, climbing up on the cross. I worked at TMZ, and you can you work there. You're part of it, right? But you're, you're there, and you're doing things, and you're, you're having fights, and you're, you're, you're doing all of this stuff. And I'm not trying to make it seem like it was a constant fight for my cultural soul every day at TMZ. Look, I enjoyed working there. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying all of the stuff that you do say and the fights that you do have and all of that stuff, you're doing all of that. And then Kanye West comes in and says, hey, slavery, not that big deal. Kind of black people's fault. I'm like, you don't hear yourself? You too, you're, you're too minted and goaded to say something like that. And it's untrue. And it's not even true. So, Explain to the people who bought that narrative why that's untrue. It's untrue for myriad reasons. Number one, the, what, like one reason why it's untrue is because slavery then and slavery anytime is a system, right? There were a lot of different ways that slaves revolted against slave masters. First of all, there were outright revolts, 
some that you've heard of, some that you have not heard of, where slaves picked up arms and revolted against masters. But the question you have to ask yourself is, what is a revolutionary act while you're a slave, right? Is taking up a, a hatchet and killing a master the only thing that you can do to revolt while you're a slave? No, your ancestors revolted every single day. They revolted by getting married. They revolted when mothers walked away from plantations to other plantations to see their children at night. They revolted by slowing down the work. They revolted by becoming skilled workers. They revolted and stepped out of the idea that they were mindless beasts that had no other utility on this earth rather than to work and toil for somebody else in a lot of different ways. They revolted by learning to read when they could. There were so many ways that they refused to be pigeonholed into the uh, identity that America had for them. And if not for their survival and their ingenuity and their, brain th their uh, bravery and their strength, we're not having this conversation. And not only that, but slaves that were then freed, like Frederick Douglass and other people, were key factors and figures in the abolition movement that eventually brought slavery to, his, to its knees. The white man would have you believe that it was his decision to start slavery and then his decision to stop it and that you had absolutely no agency in that decision. It's just not true. It's important to be able to be well read on your history to know what your people are responsible for. And even if they hadn't done any of that, if there hadn't been a Nat Turner, if there hadn't been a Denmark Vesey, if there hadn't been a Harriet Tubman, if there hadn't been a Frederick Douglass, if there hadn't been any of those people, right? They survived. They lived. They didn't fold up. They that, were, that, that in itself was a revolt. That in and of itself was a revolt. They survived. They lived. They prayed themselves into a future. They endured themselves into a future. And they did it all so your black ass could sit up here and make some fucking rap songs. How dare you? Yeah. And it and it'll always be that way. A lot of people walking around doing it, it'll it, it it'll and look, I'm from the South. It's different. I'm from the South. So I'm from a place where you drive down Holland Road and it's an antebellum home. You drive down Nicholson and it's an antebellum home. You go out home to Maringuin and all of my people are buried in the same place where my father rests now. And by the time you walk back to the back of the the the, the, the cemetery, it's slaves buried back there. So it's different. Maybe you're a little bit more close to it. I'm not from any of those other places. But if we can agree on one thing, the one thing we should be able to agree on is to honor our ancestors because every culture that's worth anything does. Right, right, right. Damn, boy, you hit, boy, you hit that one out the park. Man, are you aware that you're one of our greatest voices of this generation? Do you Are you aware of that? Sometimes when you're making history... You don't really, you're not really aware of you know, your importance and your lot in making that history. Yeah, not really. And the only reason why I would say that is because, like, it's people that really, to me, the most important people of the generation are uh, Philip Agnew, Tiffany Lofton, Jamar Burley, um, you know, Jamila Lemieux. Uh, Tamika Mallory, my son. To me, the people that are the most, Jason Wilson, the people that I, what I do is I look at a bunch of things and try to translate culture for people. But it's somewhere right now where people are getting fucked over and guys like Hawk Newsom, even though me and Hawk don't disagree, me and Hawk disagree on so many things. <laughs> and, you know, politically we don't align all the time. But if something go wrong, he gonna be there. With the when the guy in Colorado, the farmer in Colorado, was having the people surrounding him uh, try to take his farm, there were people that were actually had guns and on ATVs that camped out at the farm to protect the black farmer. Those are the people to me that are really the most important. And those people almost never, ever get platformed. Black Men Build is Philip Agnew's foundation. Everybody should check it out. That's about black men 
building and establishing power and identity in their communities. Those people that are doing that work every single day, um, I think those are the people that that need the platforms and need to be talked to. You know, what you're saying is 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 true. Uh, but again, you can't minimize your impact because as you were saying, you translate their voices, you translate their messages. Mm. You know, when you talk about you know the different people that you name, which I'm I'm, I'm familiar with most of them. Yeah. Um, and they're doing great work. Shout, shout, shout I salute. I always Trey. I always Trey salute. Truth. Yeah. I always I always give. Um, I always pay homage. Yeah. To the people that are on the ground. You know, that's actually out there exposed every day. Like people don't even understand these people are risking their lives. They think that, oh, everything is a hustle. Oh, everything is just, uh, you know, uh, a person shielding for a political party or whatever, whatever. But these people are risking their lives every day. They don't understand how dangerous it is to be an activist. And they don't talk to these people. Like, people can have whatever opinions they want to have about uh, people that I know. Because I know people on the leftist activist side of it. I know people on the super duper black revolutionary nationalist side of it. Everybody has a seat at that table to me. But when I talk to people like Alicia Garza, who was uh, was one of the founders of Black Lives Matter, and people she's talking about the criticism that she gets, she's also telling me that you know she has to have people outside of her door. There have to be people that guard her. That there are consequences to all of this stuff, like DeRay and all of these different people. We have never, ever, ever fully trusted the people that are working on behalf of us. And I understand why. I understand why it's hard. Black people are conditioned to look for the agent, to look for the person that is going to sell us out. Because there's always been somebody that was willing to do that. There's always... You've seen The Matrix before? In The Matrix, yeah. if, you have, if you haven't seen The Matrix... There's the real world and there's the matrix world. And the matrix world is invented to keep everybody com producing, right? And there's a crew of people led by Lawrence Fishburne who are just one of many ships that are trying to destroy the matrix and free everybody. The only problem is that on the other side of freedom, there's a harder life. The world has been destroyed. The food isn't as good. So there's one guy named Cypher that says, I don't want to do that. I would rather live in the matrix, I would rather live as a well-fed, well-paid slave than I would as a free person. And that decision, although we revile it, if you live in the real world, it's completely understandable. It's completely understandable why somebody would say that's too much work. Like, it's easier for me to be protected than it is to be free. It's easier for me to be tolerated than it is to be loved and respected. It's easier. But for black people, the stakes are absolutely astronomical for that idea because when one of us is pitted against each other or when one of us is put in a position to lead other black Americans astray uh, to benefit power, they take so many people with us and they set us back generations. So when you're looking at these people, a lot of times we're not listening to them and looking at them in good faith. We're actually trying to pick out the glitches in them so that we don't end up following someone who's false. Mm -hmm. So that we don't end up being led down the primrose path. And then we start thinking, okay, anyway, all I'm saying is, so I get it and I understand it, but the lives of these people that I know at least, have not been made a whole lot easier by the fact that they've dedicated their lives to pushing forward black people. I just don't know anyone. People talking about all the houses that got bought, I don't know none of that. I don't know about none of that. The people that I know, a lot of them have had to scale down significantly their public persona so they can really lead normal lives because they want to help black people. Is any of the Black Lives Matter criticism warranted? Yes. Certainly. What, what part of it? Um, when, when you're dealing with people who have the scars of being betrayed, 
you have got to make sure that uh, you continue in cultural connection with them. You have got to make sure that they don't feel like in any way that their pain is being monetized. And the way other people might do it, now, and whether this is ignorance, you just don't know how to deal with having a windfall of cash, or whether it's impropriety, it's on you to continue to be authentic and continue to be in lockstep with those people. And doing it the way certain members and certain people did it at that time, it's just not the way. Like, it's not, it's not going to be the way. The first thing, the first thing you have to do is put, for, before you put black people first, you have to put black person first. So the individual black person is how every black person to me that I know, I can't speak for all black people, 40 million of us, that's how they see themselves. They see themselves in, hey, you know what? If I need to get, if I need to get something, if I need to have something, does this group, does this person care about me? Forget about whether or not they're going to change legislation and all of that stuff like that. If somebody in, in East St. Louis loses their job for discrimination, y'all going to come here. Like, can we rely on you? Can we trust you? And I do think that the, drop, the ball was dropped, at least in appearances, um, by the national structure of Black Lives Matter. That uh, all of that stuff, when it came out, it and obviously everybody knows I'm talking about the buying of the houses and the, you know, putting your, your family in charge of all of that stuff. Do I think it was done necessarily to exploit people? No, I don't think it was. I don't think that it was a grift from the beginning. But you have got to make sure that people don't lose faith and hope in you. Because the minute that people think that the death of a black person by the police benefits you, that it's a way for you to come up or get a deal, or it's a way for you to fatten your pockets, you're going to go into a cultural pit that you're never going to come back from. Well, does that does that hold true also for the attorneys that go out there and get the money when in the in civil lawsuits? Because you know there are people who I've had to argue down that mm -hmm. hey man, you know Ben Crump is going to get financial compensation. He can't guarantee he can't guarantee that a cop is punished you know, and has to do time, his job is to go get the money. His job is not to make sure that the cop is convicted, you know, and all of that type of stuff, even mm -hmm. though that would be nice if he could, if he had that type of power, but right. that's not his lane. I mean, what do you say to that? Ben Crump has to exist. Like, the main fight on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, right? Uh, not the main fight, but one of the main fights is over qualified immunity. Right? And qualified immunity would be the thing. Uh, it's the issue about whether or not you can individually sue a police officer for misconduct. Forget about suing the state, uh, the, the station or the precinct or whatever, right? Whether or not Officer Daniels does something, then you can sue Officer Daniels. They don't want that because they don't think that officers can do their job if they are threatened with lawsuits uh, for malpractice, malfeasance, or whatever. That's how powerful money is. Money is the most, it is the most important thing in America. It's what America was founded on, like capitalism and all of that stuff. It, that type of economic power funds your military. It undergirds every decision that's made. So when Ben Crump is going out there and getting money for victims, He's actually, in my opinion, punishing the system in the way that they care most about. Like, I think the thing that they care most about is how much money they have in their coffers. The whole defunding the police thing isn't about not having a safe public. It's about reimagining public safety where the police don't get $10 billion. Maybe they get $5 billion dollars. I think in New York, the biggest police budget, I think it's like six, six or seven billion dollars. Maybe they don't need seven billion dollars. Maybe they need four. And maybe with the extra two, we reinvest it into the community. We set up mental health facilities and we set up all different types of things. So that, we don't need them. So we don't need them. Yeah. Right. What do they rail against? Having less money. 
well, why do we get to have less money? We need tanks and fucking AR-15s, and we need the more police, and the pol police need to feel that investment. So to me, when Ben is doing what he's doing, uh, he has to exist because making people pay, to me, is the thing that they care most about. Now, attorneys are never really going to have like a super sterling reputation with a lot of people because you know, they're attorneys. They're, <laughs> they're attorneys. <laughs> but to me, um, I choose to see the good in people, particularly black people. I think you have to have Ben. I think he's 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 it's necessary. He's absolutely necessary. Not just Ben, but Lee Merritt, like all of these. They're absolutely necessary. You have to have them. Somebody got to pay. Yeah. Do we have to have? Kamala Harris as president over Donald Trump. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you like Kamala over Donald? Uh, so for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, I'm going to start on Kamala Harris because I think it would be typical if I started on why I don't like Donald Trump. I'll tell you why I like Kamala Harris. And I don't, I, I'm not saying that Kamala Harris is a perfect political um a perfect political, a perfect politician, but I'll tell you why I like her. To me, principle is what undergirds politics, if you're a real politician, right? So let's say, so people will talk about Kamala Harris and that the fact that she's different on some issues now than she used to be. What they never ask her, what never gets asked is what does she learn, right? So when I'm 31, 32, 33 years old, I'm an advocate of single-payer health care. It's the only way to save American health care. And that is true. Single-payer health care in this country, to me, health care for all is one of the major issues of American society. Now, you feel that way when you're 31, 32, 33. If you're Kamala Harris, you felt that way back in the day. Or if you're any other person. You get inside of the political structure and then you realize that single payer health care might not happen for a generation, it might not happen for two generations. There's not the political will to make it happen, even on your side. And then at the same time, things are so intractable that that might not be a feasible and a realistic solution to the health care problem in America right now. Then the question becomes, what can we do? Is the ACA good enough? Are other situations that are federally that are federally mandated and and um uh, and well federally mandated is the only word are they good enough? So when I see the changes in Kamala Harris's political philosophy on a lot of things, I've seen a change being affected by her understanding certain political realities now that she didn't understand as a political neophyte before, as someone who jumped onto the national stage in the late 2010s. That was a, a lot more left, but probably a lot more idealistic. She's been there for four years and she's seen to me what she can do and how she can affect and serve the most people. And despite the fact that there are some challenges in America right now and those challenges are real, I think coming from what we came from, it is better to stay on the trajectory right now of someone who is going to who is looking to optimize the buying power of the middle class and optimize the rise and the stability of the middle class. By the way, I think that neither side talks about the lower class as much. We talk about the American middle class, but I think we need to have more conversations about the American lower class and how those lower class people get to middle class. But when I see her and, and what she's talking about, I see progress and I see moving away from some of the corrosive um, and backwards political discussions that we've been having since the rise of Trumpism. Is that just because she's trying to become president, she wants your vote, or do you think that that's really coming from an authentic place? I think it's coming from an authentic place. I do think that we have to understand, at least I do, I'm not going to tell anybody else what to do. I understand what politics is, right? Politics, particularly a political uh, campaign, is an extended first date, you know? Like, it's an extended first date. Like, at the beginning of the first date, you're on your best behavior, whatever, whatever. In the middle, you feel comfortable making a couple of jokes. Now, you might make fun of where she went to school. You might play with her a little bit. 
at the end, you know what I'm saying? And then uh, towards the end of the day, you're not comfortable now. Now, Fuck everybody. I'm never doing this. <laughs> <laughs> you're not comfortable now, so now you have a little bit of information to work with. What is she cool with? What is what is this person cool with? What are they into? What might she do? What might not she do? Now you know her a little bit. Um, but at, at, at the beginning, you still are trying to show a version of yourself that's not necessarily inauthentic, but a version of yourself that you want people to that you want people to see, that you want people to uh, consume. I hate it. I hate it. When I'm in front of anybody, I just like to have the conversation straight up. And I think that it would I think if there's one thing to be said about Donald Trump is that he he's a, a ridiculous liar, but he means all of his lies. Like he means them. He lies on purpose. He doesn't get caught in an accidental lie. He's he has a point of view and he he's too narcissistic to hide himself from people. He's that fucked up. And it always comes out. So, you know, I do think there's a part of her that people that know her, and I don't know her, but when you talk to people, people that know her see that maybe hasn't quite been reflected on the campaign trail, but I think that's par for the course with most politicians. Hmm. You don't, uh, when you look at Donald Trump, mm -hmm. what's the first thing that comes to mind? America. Expound. The first black president we ever had, Barack Obama, right? He was exceptional in every single way. He was a once-in-a-generation orator, once-in-a-generation style and swag. Um, editor of the Harvard Law Review. Fantastic student. Came from nothing, built himself into being the president that he was, Right? Um, just went out and, and just nailed everything to have a chance at that. The guy before him was a C student that had never succeeded at anything. That didn't succeed in business. That didn't succeed as the owner of the Rangers to a degree. Yeah. That, that had chance after chance after chance. But he's the president because his ancestors were on the Mayflower. His father was vice president, then president. His... Um, Prescott Bush, all of these people, his family goes back. They are minted in America. So then he gets a chance to be the president basically as a C student. Because he was chosen. He was chosen basically as a C yeah. student. Donald Trump is that but mutated because he is the version of this country. He is the actual truth of America, which is America uh, is a country that because of money and dominance, nobody else can tell them no. No one can tell America no because the military is too strong, because the lies that the country has told, uh, if they are threatened to be exposed as true, it threatens the world order too much. It's something that you just have to go along with and hold your nose. Donald Trump was born into money. He became a celebrity. All the while, we didn't really know who he was. And now that he has the perch that he has, he doesn't really stand for anything. He doesn't really believe in anything. The one thing he stands for and believes in more than anything is the idea of Donald Trump. <laughs> the idea of who he is. And people, look, like Donald Trump will literally make a promise and then his campaign will walk it back. Donald Trump will say something and then people will be like, that's not what he really meant. People believe in Donald Trump so much that it doesn't matter what he actually does. It just matters what he says. So with America, people believe in America so much, it doesn't matter if black women have the highest rate of maternal mortality. Mm. It doesn't matter if you have all of these people that don't have access to health care, running water, clean water. It doesn't matter any of that. You believe in America so much that I could tell you, hey, right now things aren't equal. We're not all living in the same. We don't all have the same. I, I can't be true. You can't have that in this country. If the schools are decaying. If the schools are decaying. Know, yeah. If everybody's getting shot up where you're from. If everybody mm -hmm. has HIV where you're from. If everyone, I, I talked to a lady and I, we were in North Carolina. I can't remember this lady's name, but she said something so crazy. She was like, um, 
if you walked by a lake and you saw one fish that was belly up in the lake, you walk by and you'd be like, what's wrong with that fish? Now, if you walk by that same lake and you saw 300 fish that were belly up, what would you say? What's wrong with the lake? You'd say, what's wrong with that lake? Right. Right? Right. But it doesn't matter how many how many fish go belly up in America. It's never the lake. Mm. And it doesn't matter how many times Donald Trump fucks up what he does, how he screws up, be it January 6th, be it the phone call where he's talking to Raffensperger, asking this man to find the votes, be it the big lie, whatever it is, it's never Donald Trump. Be it the grab it by the... The grab, grab it by the... By, yeah, be, no, yeah, it's man. never him. Yeah. It's always somebody that's out to get him. It's always somebody that has it in for him. It's never him. And the most American thing is never having to say you're sorry. We were slaves in this country for all of this time, built the wealth of this country. We had to drag an apology out of America, and they still won't really apologize, because if they really were going to apologize, they would uh, reimburse us for all of the work that our ancestors did, right? Mm. But America's too big to say I'm sorry. And arrogant. Arrogant. And so to me, when I see him, I, people say, we were eventually going to get here, where the where truth didn't matter, where decency didn't matter, where none of this stuff matters. The only thing that mattered is whether or not you think this person will give you an advantage over the rest of the people in America that you think are lesser than. And so to me, when I see him, I'm not, it's not grotesque or anything to me. It is to me. I mean, I get it, but what, what I see is the natural progression of having zero. I think it's, I think it's skin stink. <laughs> But good, good. It looked like it stink. It looked like it's pulse. It's about to, like, you know, I just look at him. It's just, I always look like pulse about to come out. But go ahead. No, I just see the, anyway, I just see the natural progression of never asking power in the country to be accountable. Yeah, yeah. And it trickles down. Of course. That's why we have so many issues, like, on the ground with just normal, regular people, man. It trickles down because we see the people up at the top doing all of this uncivilized stuff. Mm -hmm. And we go like, well, if it's good enough for them, got to be good enough for Got to be good enough for us. If it's good enough for Trump to lie, steal, and cheat and talk about killing his adversaries, it's Mm -hmm. good enough for me. Got to be. Got to be. Absolutely amazing. Do you uh, believe uh, the woman who said that she saw Trump at the uh, freak offs? Uh, (laughs) Adria, uh, what's that? Adria English. She said she saw Trump at one of the Puff's freak offs. I don't know. You don't believe Trump? I think Trump was there. It, I think my, was th- there. my thing is, as far as that's concerned, it, 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 I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> if anybody was at the free calls. Yeah. yeah. There's nobody you could tell me was at the free calls, and I'd be like, they went to a free call. Like, at this point, I, think, I, I personally think that that case, that case and the way that that case is going to play out is going to be one of the most important cultural developments ever. It's going to change the landscape of entertainment forever. It is. It is. So sad, so sad for you boys that y'all didn't get a chance to just really enjoy yourselves. But, uh, you know, that time is gone, man. That ship has passed. Right. Bro, like, man. But, yeah, I think, let me tell you what I think about Donald Trump uh, and the freak off. (laughs) I think Trump, first of all, I believe Adria. I believe her, never met her before in my life, but I've heard Trump lie a lot. So I'm just weighing, you know, th- my options here and I'm just going with what's most likely to be the truth. And so I'm just going with Adria's version. She says she saw him there, but I'm going to add this part. She didn't say this, but I'm adding what I think could have happened and how he could have ended up there. So I think he was invited, you know, because he up the street from, from uh, Diddy. So he came through. And he uh, he pulled out his wallet. The girl came, sat on his lap, and he pulled out his wallet, and he finna hit off with uh, one hundred sixty-three thousand dollars. And um, the girl was like, "No, no, no! Diddy's pay for everything. Diddy, Diddy already paid for everything. Baby, it's free. Everything free. Right. The food free. The drinks free. You know, the drugs is free. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the coochie free, baby. It's now, freak you off. Put your money up. Yeah." But then she smelled his breath and she said, on second thought, <laughs> I need you to pay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me 
get that 163000 And then once he gave her the money, she moved in a little closer, and she was like, she jumped up and just ran to the back and started crying. Yeah. You know how they run to the back really uh, dramatically? They run, she was running. No, tell me, speed. how do they run to the back? They I've run never had to the back. They just run. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've never had that happen. You've seen it in the movies, All man. Right. <laughs> I'm talking about in the movies. <laughs> she just took off running. She just, uh -huh. Like in the cartoon. So she ran to the back. And when she got to the back, the other girl came in, one of the girls that, one of the leaders, uh -huh. could have been Cassie. Uh, so one of the leaders was like, <laughs> don't worry about it, don't worry about it. You know, just just take this. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hit her up with a couple of pills and stuff. Uh -huh. She took the pills and, she, and she, she went back out there and she didn't know who he was. At this time, the drugs you know, have taken over. It ta and she Word forgot up. the whole situation. Mm -hmm. But when Trump got done, I believe, I believe he left with, uh, like, his drawers, just in his drawers, some uh, Willie, what Speedos. The <laughs> I think he had some Speedos when he left. Uh-huh. And he, and he took off. And uh, he left and got in the limo mm -hmm. in his drawers. And the driver and Secret Service was like, you know, right. they just kind of looked at just each like, other like, oh, hey, hey, hey this, know, this is this is Big D. This is like, the, this is what happens. It's the Big D, you yeah, know. Right. The Big D, you know, around a bunch of Big Ds. You know what I'm talking <laughs> about? You know, I, I'm just saying, I'm Don't just thinking like if he was there, like she say he was, mm -hmm. I just kind of... The, 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 like it the, went like that. The thing you know? is, why do I have some Trump fan fiction right there? The thing is, he was. By the way, this type of like sexual misconduct is bipartisan. True story. The most bipartisan thing that true story uh, Hollywood and Washington ever did. The most bipartisan achievement of the last twenty years was killing Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. That was on both yeah. sides. Every yeah. your liberals, your Republicans, everybody that had that guy as a gopher, that was truly bipartisan. Do you think that Diddy uh, is in danger of what? Of being killed while he's in lockup? Oh, um, I think it's different because I think he's the he's probably the tip of the spear here. And what I mean by that is that, like, I don't know. I mean, obviously, if Trump were there, it would be different. But I don't know if there are too many people that are much bigger than him uh, that will fall here, which is a little bit different than the Jeffrey Epstein. Jeffrey Epstein had uh, Prince Andrew. That's royalty. That's Buckingham Palace. Bill Clinton. He had, uh, um, obviously, Donald Trump was a, was a good friend. You had Alan Dershowitz, Bill Gates, all kinds of super, really important yeah. people that— Apparently, and I'm not saying any of these people had Jeffrey Epstein killed, but what I'm saying is those people were acquaintances of him. And it seems like if there was anything to be said or anything to be revealed, uh, that he could really threaten the absolute ground floor of American power. Yeah. I don't know if Puff can. I don't I don't yeah. think that it's the same. You have celebrities, you have A-list celebrities, yeah, and then you have Dignitaries, people that make this, the the world go right. Yeah, lawmakers. You know, yeah, people who shape legislation. Yeah, that's a different level of power. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it, you know, it, it might people might be you know sad that their favorite their their favorite celebrity, actor, singer, executive maybe is involved in some of the stuff that they're alleging Puff was involved in, but uh, that'll be a much more of a cultural shift than it will to like really destroy um, the fundraising, political donations, the people standing in various parties and uh, and threatening some of the tops and the, some of the oldest power in the world. When you're talking about the royal family, you're talking about generations upon generations upon generations of, of, of wealth and global influence. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a major, major, major person to be, I mean, a major thing for them to, to have to deal with, right? Well, they say this person is supposedly bigger than Diddy, who is in a video with Diddy, smashing. Yeah, but a bigger like, celebrity. No, they said just they just said a, 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 a they list celebrity. celebrity. They like said a, it was, the person was bigger than Diddy. Could be. Um, I mean, what do they mean bigger? No, I'm just joking. 
but it, it, it like it could like it, it could be but like even if it is if you're talking about I'm not gonna name any names but you probably if you're talking about this huge singer or this huge whatever people's feelings would be hurt more than anything would actually change but right. if it was an ex president right right or the CEO of, of BlackRock. That video ain't coming out for 50 uh, to 100 years. Yeah. It's coming out someday, though. Yeah. But it won't be. For but, like, yeah, if it was somebody the players that really be dead. Yeah, that people cared about losing because it would change everything. Yeah. Yeah, then it, 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 the, the stakes are different. Speaking of singing songs, mm -hmm. if you could pick one song that could serve as the background soundtrack for your life. Van Lathan, this song represents me more than any other song. When I walk into a room, which one would it be? That song that's going to play every yeah. time you walk into a room. What song is it? J Electronica, Swagger Jackson's Revenge. Swagger Jackson's Revenge. Jackson's J Electronica. Revenge. Now you're going to get everybody to go check it out if they haven't already. There are songs that I like more. Like I could easily say uh, 400 Degrees because that's number two. Yeah. Right, I could easily say that, um, but now you're getting on your Aerie Spears tip, man. Just naming the local stuff, the boys oh, from, from, from the hood. That's the shit that I fucking <laughs> fuck with the most. Um, but that that song, when you listen to it, first of all, I think Jay Electronica is a goddamn he is dope. genius. Yeah, you dope. But that that song, when you listen to it, that to me, first of all, it just has a ridiculous sound. Yeah, it's fantastically produced, and he's a great rapper. But that song describes the way I look at the world. You know, if a nigga with a president's mask on, run up in the bank with a Glock saying, gimme, gimme, I ain't glad at him, but I ain't mad at him. Like, you, you know what I mean? So, yeah. like, it's like, like, how far can you really push people? Uh, like, I don't want you to do that, but I get it. And that's kind of, that kind of describes my thing. I don't want you to do the shit that you feel like you, I don't want you to do it. But I'm not going to act like I'm better than you. Like, I get it. I understand it. And what he's essentially is, is describing in that in that record to me is, like, why people don't believe. Like, why like why people don't have any faith in anything. Like, why? I mean, well, how are they supposed to have faith in it? Yeah. It keeps failing them. So that's, that, that's a, I listen to that record all the time, a couple of times a week, you know, like, no matter what. You think Jay Z made the right call with not putting Wayne on that stage for Super Bowl twenty five in two thousand twenty five? That would be that would be Super Bowl what fifty nine? Yeah, whatever. Yeah, Super Bowl fifty nine. Yeah. At first I cared, but then I realized I don't I don't give a fuck. <laughs> At first I was like, because you know the Louisiana in me is like, man, put Wayne up there and Wayne, yeah. Wayne, 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 Wayne. And then I thought about it. I was like, why do I don't give a fuck? I don't fucking care. I don't care. Like who put whoever up there that you want is your show, whatever. Like, my issues with the NFL and the halftime show and all of that stuff um, has to do back with 2019 and Colin Kaepernick and Jay-Z and all of that stuff. So whoever they want to put up there, God bless everyone. Have you forgiven Wayne for those comments that he made about black folks, you know, not being slaves anymore and how there's no racism? I think he, what was the, I can't remember the name of that show, but he was talking to that woman. I, I remember you having something to say about that. Um, what was the name of that show? I can't remember well, the he name was on, of the show. Well, he was on, he said it a couple times. He said it once on 60 Minutes. He said it a couple times. Wayne, he's consistent with him not giving a fuck about that type of deal. First of all, it's, I don't have to, there's nothing to forgive. That's how he feels. Um, I think it's ridiculous. And I also think sometimes, so hip hop, I love hip hop. You lo love hip hop. You built, you built hip hop. You help build hip hop. Yep, yeah, straight up. I help. help build hip hop. Like straight up. Like uh, my daddy had lived out here in Houston for a little while. We was moving around trying to find the right economy. We left Baton Rouge. Came to Dallas a little bit. Came to Houston a little bit. And when he heard uh, some ghetto boy shit, he heard the term like Fifth Ward in the song, and he's like, "Oh, they talking about they talking about Houston." And he didn't know that it was rappers from Houston. Mm -hmm. And that's the first time I realized it, realized it was rappers from Houston. It was rappers from the South, and these rappers could be big, and these rappers could do all of that stuff. So it's very important. All of that stuff is is very important. Hip-hop has been very important to my development. But there is something else about hip-hop that I think we don't talk about enough, right? And it's the fact that hip-hop is super-duper interesting in terms of its cultural intersection with, with, with black America because it is— 
preaches in the music anti establishment this um uh, it did it did uh anti authority all of that stuff meanwhile in the execution of hip hop it is as american as apple pie so you had a bunch of people who were essentially talking about all of this stuff but they were undergirded by these enormous corporate structures and these enorm these enormous corporate structures funded the music Pay for the music, commercials, and all of this. The message of the music is one thing. And what the rappers had to do to make money and stay relevant in the music is completely other. So when a rapper or someone has no type, especially as we moved on. In the 90s, I just didn't really know this many rappers who didn't, who didn't have nothing to say about their people when you put a mic in front of their face. It just wasn't, it, I just never, I didn't know as much of that. But when I got on, when you would ask, because it's not just Wayne, they asked Young Thug, it's like, what do you care about, like, what's going on with the police and all of that stuff? Young Thug is like, yo, man, we here at the thing, we doing all this. When these guys don't care about that stuff, it doesn't really affect me because their job is to be a little mini corporation inside of a bigger corporation of people that are telling them the way that you become the best at what you do, the, excuse me, the way that you become... Uh, the most important is to make as much money and have as much influence as power and nothing else matters. So when someone asks you a question about you, what you really think, what I wonder sometimes is, have you ever taken the time to wonder what you really think? Or are you trying to sell somebody something else? Are you trying to sell somebody the next record? Are you trying to sell somebody the next liquor? Are you trying to sell somebody the next thing? So why would you say something that might make the white kids that keep you rich or the kind of racist people that keep you rich or the apolitical people that keep you rich, why would you say something to make them uncomfortable? Like, why would you do that? That makes no sense to do that. America doesn't do that. America sells the biggest, hugest ideas to people. And then the ones that go, wait a minute, we're suffering because of that, they go boom, boom. Hmm. Right? So when I look, when I look at hip hop, I think it's very interesting. I think what happened after a time was we we put so much into our rappers. So much. Because think about it. When I was growing up, if you if you were born in 1950, well, then when you came up in the 50s and the 60s, you had tremendous figures of black intellectualism that were giving you all different types of approaches to how we can think our way out of our problems, right? You had King. You had Fannie Lou Hammer. Hamer. You had Ella Baker. You had... Rustin. You had some people that were kind of, you had Stokely Carmichael. You had Fred Hampton. You had the Panthers. You had all kinds of different people that were giving you different ways. Well, when I was growing up. You had the la last poets and watch prophets. All of that. Yeah. All of those people, right? When I was growing up, I essentially had rappers. The, mm -hmm. the black intellectuals and movement leaders from that time had been jailed or they were dead. Um, and the people that I was looking to, besides Minister Farrakhan and some of the other people, that that movie was pretty much over. I was looking up to Michael Jordan and to Tupac to give me all of this stuff. And then later on, Jay-Z and people like that. Those were the best. Oh, this is what I'm hearing. Rock him, all of those people. Well, those people got corporatized. They got corporatized. They got corporatized to where they would sell you rebelling, rebellion. But when they're not selling it to you on wax, they're doing rich nigga shit. They're telling you, bang, bang, shoot them up, but then they're in the Hamptons. They're giving you two different versions of it. So what happened was the shoe contract and all of that stuff became paramount and more important than anything else. So when a rapper doesn't give a fuck about any of that stuff, it doesn't surprise me because they haven't had to. We haven't asked them to we've taken their model and we then said that's the American model of success but we haven't asked them for anything in return well because rappers have such great influence you know along with other celebrities uh, when you consider the political landscape when you consider what's going on socially um, you know should they be allowed to be neutral or should yeah. they or should they be expected to stand take a stand 
I think everyone should be allowed to be neutral. The only thing that I would say is this. This is what I don't like. Okay? Everyone should be allowed to be neutral. Nobody has to care. Right? And a lot of people don't care. And there's various different reasons to care. I'm not about to get on somebody's head when, like I said, there's people that's doing more than me. The only thing that I'm saying is this. What I don't like is using the black community as a fire extinguisher. Because what I hear for a lot from a lot of people is I never see them really doing anything or being proactive about anything. But as soon as they have an issue with their record label, as soon as they have an issue with the police, man, the tennis shoe. as soon as they have an issue, as soon as they're accused of something, as soon as they have an issue with something, it's like they're accusing a black man of this. Kanye became black real fucking fast when he had an issue with Adidas. Right? So it's like, it's the, the, stay not black. <laughs> like stay like they, they, hey, they won't let a black man do this. They won't let a black man do that. They won't let a black man do this. They're treating young black men like this. I can't be a young black man like this. Like black is a responsibility to me, and it's not a responsibility that you always take up, but it's a responsibility that has to be in the back of your mind, right? So. That's the only thing I don't like. I don't think Wayne has to have an opinion on that. I think when he says there's no such thing as racism, if I was able to have a conversation with him, if I was able to have a conversation with him, I'd be like, Wayne, all of the stuff that you rap about, where you come from, how you had the things that you had to overcome, how you had to grow, all of the obstacles, that's because of racism. Like your city that was flooded in 2005, the reasons why that happened and the aftermath is because of structural racism the reason why new orleans and parts of new orleans and baton rouge and all of these places have looked the way that they've looked for all of this time is because of very deliberate and intentional decisions by people who have all gotten together and decided that niggas shouldn't have nothing the reason why the south is poor is because a lot of southern whites chose poverty over equality and so to me, like, I, if we had the opportunity to have that conversation, I think people can make that inroads. I can make inroads with him. But if he actually feels that way, I'll be like, how's he supposed to feel? He going to rap about how hard it is to grow up somewhere, and then he going to go to France. And then the niggas that are down there actually in those places, they will want to be Wayne. They don't want to fix their problems. They want to forget them. And I get that. Right. Like I get saying, hey, I, I, I understand it. It's it's a human thing. I don't judge like they do, it's two different things. Wanting to fix a problem means that I come from something. I understand how it goes and how it's been. Let me try to change things. And by the way, I'm not painting hip hop with a broad brush. It's plenty of nips out there. Plenty of them. We see rappers and hip hop artists. Tef Poe, Trey the Truth. I can name so many of them that have dedicated their lives to this, but I'm talking about mainstream money-making, money-getting hip-hop, right? The people that want to be, they don't, they want to, a lot of these guys stay high, so they don't have to remember the problems that they encountered on Monday when it's a Thursday. So they definitely don't want to encounter the problems that they, that the problems that they encountered when they were 11 or 12 years old. And so I don't hold it against Wayne, but I'm also not going to be like, it's such a big fucking crime that he didn't get the Super Bowl. Wayne is a fucking legend. And if they decide they want to go with somebody else for the Super Bowl, fuck it. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, fuck it. Everybody will be all right. Yeah. What, what are some of the downfalls or setbacks that have happened in your life that have made you better? Mm. Ooh, that's a good question, Willie. Um, uh, anxiety attacks. Yeah. Being uh, diagnosed with that, like having anxiety attacks since I was about 23 or 24. It, that made me understand how to regulate myself. Uh, and when I didn't understand it then, but you, get to a, you got to a point in Baton Rouge, and everybody deals with this different. You got to a point in Baton Rouge where everybody just started getting killed. And we just moved past it, right? It just fucked with me in a different way. Like, it was just, it was weird. Like, you know, people always get killed and stuff. But then we went through a stretch, man, where it was just like, shit. 
like it was just shock to the system after shock to the system after shock to the system. It was GT, it was Jason, it was Delvin, it was Tedford, it was all of these guys. And <laughs> me and my boy Gino, we would sit around and be like, yo, is this shit fucking normal? So we just going to grow older and this is going to get a fight at Texaco. And then all of a sudden you're going to get shot and they're dead. Drug deals go by, dead. Find somebody, Aliquippa, car still running, shot in the back, dead. But for me, it was really hard for me to take. And so I started having anxiety attacks. And that's when I realized that I, would, I was going to have to prioritize uh, what I could take and how I dealt with things and how I navigated through things in order to be a stable person. My brain had different controls on it. So everybody else could take everything and deal with everything. But me, uh, I get to a certain point and it glitches out. And either I got to fight, fuck, or freak out. And um, and so my life became about understanding uh, how I stayed ready um, and how I stayed regulated and how I could be the most useful to myself and other people in my life. And if it hadn't been for that, I might have been on drugs somewhere or something like that. How close did you come to getting knocked off? Um... I, there was some. Uh, it was it, it got pretty bad. I mean, it just it was just like a, and it and sometimes it does. Like after my father's death, it was uh, it got pretty bad again. You know, after my dad died, I, he had been sick for a long time. He had congestive heart failure for like twenty years, but then he was gone, and I was like, "Yo, man, what the? It's tough." Did so, he go suddenly? It wasn't. So Suddenly, but it was unexpected. He had congestive heart failure, and the longer you live with that, the the worse the prognosis is. Um, you knew you were getting the call one day, but it wasn't the situation to where it's like, okay, he's in a bad way. Everybody say your goodbyes. It's like you got a call uh, on the 4th of July. I remember my sister called. I'm like, what she want? Boom, hang it up. It's early. And I said it, I promise you, it's early. It was like maybe 5.30 LA time. So was in Louisiana, it's like 6, 7.30. 7.30 in Louisiana. She called and I sent it to voicemail because I was still asleep. And when she called back, I said, dad's dead. Mm-hmm. And I picked it up and she was crying. And I already knew. Hung the phone up, get right to it. Mm-hmm. Go to Louisiana, do all the stuff. Boom, boom, boom. People that you ain't seen for a long time. Everybody's around. And it was just surreal. And I didn't I didn't deal with it well at first. What year was this? 2021. Oh. Wow. Did you, did you speak at the funeral? So everything was weird. So uh I wanted to. Then when we get to the funeral, I get to the funeral, so I wanted to. Everything ready, I was going to say, the whole nine. And we get to the funeral, I'm talking to everyone. This is the funeral that obviously me and my sister had planned. I'm talking to my sister, and she goes, oh, they, she's Catholic, they don't do that. I was like, I'm not going to be able to say nothing? And she goes, no, it's a Catholic, It's a that doesn't happen here. And so... And it was interesting, and so uh, the hard thing about my my relationship with my dad was like there was still stuff I wanted to tell him. There was still stuff that I think thought that we needed to talk about, and so that stuff now is just in the ether, oblivion of forever. Or whenever I see him again, um, and at his funeral, I wanted to say some of that stuff, but. It was almost like God was actually saying, no, that stuff is unsaid. And it should be between you and him. So don't get up here and talk about a lot of stuff and look for some type of, uh, I don't know, comfort from all of your family and all of that stuff like that. That's not going to give you anything. Like, that's not, those are not the people that you need to be talking to. You need to talk to him. 
And so I just had to, once again, just like I felt in my early 20s, he's gone and I just had to deal with it. That's just life. Yeah. And at first I didn't know how. Yeah, that had to be hard because you and your dad, yeah, really, really close, huh? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it, I was, my, see, I think another thing that's different is that like, everybody else had people that, all these people that they were trying to impress. And like all these people that they want to, you know, they want to, you, you buying shoes, you buying cars. You, I had one person to impress. My mother would have accepted me no matter how I am. She's just that type of soul. She's a beautiful soul. That's where I get all of my compassion and my care from. Mm. I get my care from my mother. I get my due from my father. But I had one guy to impress. Our our movie won the Academy Award. And <laughs> this sounds like it's about to be funny. <laughs> bro, our movie won the Academy Award. <laughs> Daddy called. Daddy was like, what's up, boy? How you doing? Like, I'm good. He's like, what is this award that people keep talking, calling me about? I was like, oh, yeah, so uh, every year um, all the white people in Hollywood get together and they pick out the movies they think are the very best movies of the year. And what movie is this? Uh, we made a, a short film called Two Distant Strangers okay. in, in 2020. And it won Best Live Action Short Film at the 2021 Academy Awards. Okay. Uh, tremendous accomplishment for Nick May, Trayvon Free, Jesse Williams, Lawrence, Bill, uh, Lawrence Binder, um, just Andrew Howard, Zaria, everyone involved. Joy Badass was the star of it. Um, uh, of course, Matt Rowe, everybody, uh, uh, Martin Desmond Rowe, should I say? Matt Rowe, too. Everybody was involved. All, all of my production, producing partners uh, that were on it. Somebody else that was a producing partner on it, too. Sean Combs. Okay. He's executive producer. He didn't do shit, but... Yeah, I have a freak out. Uh, uh, freak out. Relax, dog. No. <laughs> Relax. Relax. I had to, I had to get you. <laughs> I had to get you. Uh, wide, um, wide open, no did it. I go ahead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, he calls me. He's like, um, he's like, okay, that's good. Uh, I didn't win no award. Why, why do motherfuckers keep calling me? <laughs> I'm like, because like, you're my dad. <laughs> And it's like a major accomplishment. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, but what it got to do with me? You won an award. If they want to talk about the award, why don't they call you to talk to about the award? Why are they calling me? And I was like, you know what? Man, how you doing? We ain't caught up this week. Like, how, how, like, how you doing? What's, what's, what's going on? Well, that sounds like a dude I would have loved to have met. The man. old me would have been like, oh, man, I did this thing, and my dad didn't appreciate me, and the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon and all this dumb ass shit. But, like, at this point in my life, I was like, man, <laughs> what you got going on? Uh, that, that was like May. July was dead. Yeah. Did he ever tell you that he was proud of you? In this is what he would do. He would tell other people. He would tell, like, he would brag his ass off when I wasn't around. But he had to keep me hungry. Yeah. So it didn't matter. You know what I'm saying? It like it didn't matter. And sometimes I would hear it. Like I would hear him like we was, it was basketball one time time somebody was talking about basketball and I heard my dad on the phone going, I tell you, yeah, that boy good. He can't fuck with Van though. Van big, Van got good hands. Van like a smaller, a smaller version of his of his little cousin. Cause you know, Glenn Davis is my little cousin. Yeah. And yeah. And so he's like, um, uh, he's like, You can't fuck with Van now. Like Van, you got you got, you know, Van shoot that thing, you know, play good defense, good, good athlete. Like the whole thing, you know. I want to get you. I bring him over here. I said, I put him, and I'm like, I've never heard him talk like that before. But I heard him on the phone talk to other people. So he was, but he's probably didn't share it with me as much, though. If he had, how much difference do you think it would have made? Probably a lot. Probably just because it, um, it, it made me feel like I didn't have to, I, you know what? Maybe good and bad, right? Because it would have, my life's journey to meet his standard was always something new. It was always like, like even after the Kanye thing, I wanted him to be, I wanted him to be like, oh, well, 
You're my son. Because I've seen him do that to people. You're my son. I would expect that. And his thing was, who is Kanye West? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, who is that? Like, I think I heard of him before. And so it, it I guess it would have been good and bad because the main lesson that I had to learn was that at some point, it doesn't matter even if the person is your father, what you do uh, in your life has to be about how you see the world and what you want to contribute and how you want to look at things. It can't be about uh, stepping up or filling in or making somebody else's dream come true. It wasn't, you know, started making really good money. It, it, there's always, every single monetary situation I've been to, I thought things were going to be great once I make this amount of money. And then sometimes I look back at the numbers and the numbers were so small, it seems crazy back then. Man, if I could get to $2,000 a week, then it's like if I can get to 5000 if I can get to seven, if I can get to this amount of money a year, if I can get to this amount of money a year, and you find yourself wanting no matter what that is. No matter what it is, you find yourself wanting. Mm -hmm. Unless you get to a point and you understand how to become happy with your life and how to find small things or even large things in your life that complete and complement you and the people around you. The most important thing to me is being useful to the people in my life. Um, and so that ain't got nothing to do with him. But as far as me and his relationship, it was like we was in a room one time. And me and my homeboys in there, and it's a wasp in the room. And we being 13, 14-year-old kids, Oh shit, the wasp gonna sting you, the wasp gonna do all of that. Ah, blah, blah, blah. Hey, shit, he coming for you, dog. Blah, blah, boom, 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 all of that. But daddy walk in, sweating, hat on, gun on the side. He said, What y'all doing? All this goddamn jumping around. And uh my boy Ryan goes, It's a wasp in here, Mr. Terry. And he goes, Oh. And just grabbed it with his hand. And everybody else in the room is like, this nigga different. <laughs> Later on, um, and we out there and we getting the fucking beagles out of the pen and uh, got a big ass welt on his head. It's not that he wasn't human. Sometimes the fucking, you gotta kill the wasp. And he was just different. So he's, you know, and it wasn't just to me, like, kill a deer, put the deer over his shoulder. He walking with the deer, blood coming down everywhere. He walked past one of your homeboy's fathers who's standing there talking. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? He got the deer on his back and he like, hey boy, come out here and help me feel dress this. And my homeboy's like, what are you, you guys are about to gut the deer? And I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna put him out there in the back and skin him up and, and, and do him up. He's like, can I watch? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we're about to do it right now. So he was just different. He was impressive, man. What did they call your dad in the neighborhood? Uh, VT, uh, Mr. Terry, or the Dickies man. Because he always wore, uh, uh, when he was in uh, his full shit, it was always a full Dickie suit with the, with the hat and the boots. Yeah. And so, um, but most people called him Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry. Yeah, Mr. Terry. Mr. Terry, uh, you raised a fine young man. I appreciate that, bro. Absolutely, man. man. Thank you for coming on the show, man. No problem. Hey, I got to say one thing before I go. Yeah. I'm fucking ecstatic that this has worked out as well as it has. Yeah. You, you found your voice. Everybody is re re respects you. And you run a fucking fantastic podcast. And I know you know that it's not easy for people to transition and do the whole thing. Yeah. But it's dope. It's dope to to listen and watch a legend whenever you put your podcast out and stuff like that. I watch all of them. I especially like the one with the crazy motherfucker that made the George Floyd joke. Yeah. And um, But I, 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 I really enjoy listening to your perspective, man. It was good to talk to you, brother. Thank you, man. All right, now. The honor was mine, man. All the right. honor was mine. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Lathan. <laughs> no more talk.